Chapter One of Mystery of a Hansom Cab by Fergus Hume, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. What the Argus said: The following report appeared in the Argus newspaper of Saturday, the twenty-eighth July, eighteen. Truth is said to be stranger than fiction, and certainly the extraordinary murder which took place in Melbourne on Thursday night, or rather Friday morning, goes a long way towards verifying this saying. A crime has been committed by an unknown assassin within a short distance of the principal streets of this great city, and is surrounded by an impenetrable mystery. Indeed, from the nature of the crime itself, the place where it was committed, and the fact that the assassin has escaped without leaving a trace behind him, it would seem as though the case itself had been taken bodily from one of Gaboreau's novels, and that his famous detective Lecoq alone would be able to unravel it. The facts of the case are simply these. On the twenty-seventh day of July, at the hour of twenty minutes to two o'clock in the morning, a hansom cab drove up to the police station in Grey Street, St. Kilda, and the driver made the startling statement that his cab contained the body of a man who he had reason to believe had been murdered. Being taken into the presence of the inspector, the cabman, who gave his name as Malcolm Royston, related the following strange story. At the hour of one o'clock in the morning, he was driving down Collins Street East, when, as he was passing the Burke and Wills Monument, he was hailed by a gentleman standing at the corner by the Scotch Church. He immediately drove up, and saw that the gentleman who hailed him was supporting the deceased, who appeared to be intoxicated. Both were in evening dress, but the deceased had on no overcoat, while the other wore a short, covered coat of a light fawn color, which was open. As Royston drove up, the gentleman in the light coat said, "'Look here, cabby, here's some fellow awfully tight. You'd better take him home.' Royston then asked him if the drunken man was his friend, but the other denied, saying that he had just picked him up from the footpath, and did not know him from Adam. At this moment the deceased turned his face up to the light of the lamp under which both were standing, and the other seemed to recognize him, for he recoiled a pace, letting the drunken man fall in a heap on the pavement, and gasping out, You! He turned on his heel, and walked rapidly away down Russell Street in the direction of Bourke Street. Royston was staring after him, and wondering at his strange conduct, when he was recalled to himself by the voice of the deceased, who had struggled to his feet, and was holding on to the lamp-post, swaying to and fro. "'I want to go home,' he said in a thick voice, St. Kilda. He then tried to get into the cab, but was too drunk to do so, and finally sat down again on the pavement. Seeing this, Royston got down, and lifting him up, helped him into the cab with some considerable difficulty. The deceased fell back into the cab, and seemed to drop off to sleep. So, after closing the door, Royston turned to remount his driving-seat, when he found the gentleman in the light coat, whom he had seen holding up the deceased, close to his elbow. Royston said, "'Oh, you've come back,' and the other answered, "'Yes, I've changed my mind, and we'll see him home.' As he said this, he opened the door of the cab, stepped in beside the deceased, and told Royston to drive down to St. Kilda. Royston, who was glad that the friend of the deceased had come to look after him, drove as he had been directed. But near the Church of England Grammar School, on the St. Kilda Road, the gentleman in the light coat called out to him to stop. He did so, and the gentleman got out of the cab, closing the door after him. "'He won't let me take him home,' he said. "'So I'll just walk back to the city, and you can drive him to St. Kilda.' "'What street, sir?' asked Royston. "'Gray Street, I fancy,' said the other. "'But my friend will direct you when you get to the junction.' "'Ain't he too much on, sir?' said Royston, dubiously. "'Oh, no. I think he'll be able to tell you where he lives. It's Gray Street or Ackland Street, I fancy. I don't know which.' He then opened the door of the cab and looked in. "'Good night, old man,' he said. The other apparently did not answer, for the gentleman in the light coat, shrugging his shoulders and muttering, "'Sulky brute,' closed the door again. He then gave Royston half a sovereign, lit a cigarette, and after making a few remarks about the beauty of the night, walked off quickly in the direction of Melbourne. Royston drove down to the junction, and having stopped there, according to his instructions, he asked his fare several times where he was to drive him to. Receiving no response, and thinking that the deceased was too drunk to answer, he got down from his seat, opened the door of the cab, and found the deceased lying back in the corner with a handkerchief across his mouth. He put out his hand with the intention of rousing him, thinking that he had gone to sleep. But on touching him the deceased fell forward, and on examination, to his horror, he found that he was quite dead. Alarmed at what had taken place, and suspecting the gentleman in the light coat, 
he drove to the police station at St. Kilda, and there made the above report. The body of the deceased was taken out of the cab and brought into the station, a doctor being sent for at once. On his arrival, however, he found that life was quite extinct, and also discovered that the handkerchief, which was tied lightly over the mouth, was saturated with chloroform. He had no hesitation in stating that from the way in which the handkerchief was placed, and the presence of chloroform, that a murder had been committed, and from all appearances the deceased died easily and without a struggle. The deceased is a slender man, of medium height, with a dark complexion, and is dressed in evening dress, which will render identification difficult, as it is a costume which has no distinctive mark to render it noticeable. There were no papers or cards found on the deceased from which his name could be discovered, and the clothing was not marked in any way. The handkerchief, however, which was tied across his mouth, was of white silk, and marked in one of the corners with the letters O.W. in red silk. The assassin, of course, may have used his own handkerchief to commit the crime, so that if the initials are those of his name they may ultimately lead to his detection. There will be an inquest held on the body of the deceased this morning, when, no doubt, some evidence may be elicited which will solve the mystery. In Monday morning's issue of the Argus the following article appeared with reference to the matter. The following additional evidence which has been obtained may throw some light on the mysterious murder in a hansom cab of which we gave a full description in Saturday's issue. Another hansom cabman called at the police office, and gave a clue which will, no doubt, prove of value to the detectives in their search for the murderer. He states that he was driving up the St. Kilda Road on Friday morning about half-past one o'clock, when he was hailed by a gentleman in a light coat, who stepped into the cab and told him to drive to Powlett Street in East Melbourne. He did so, and after paying him, the gentleman got out of the corner of Wellington Parade in Powlett Street, and walked slowly up Powlett Street, while the cab drove back to town. Here all clue ends, but there can be no doubt in the minds of our readers as to the identity of the man in the light coat, who got out of Royston's cab on the St. Kilda Road, with the one who entered the other cab, and alighted therefrom at Powlett Street. There could have been no struggle, as had any taken place the cabman, Royston, surely would have heard the noise. The supposition is, therefore, that the deceased was too drunk to make any resistance, and that the other, watching his opportunity, placed the handkerchief saturated with chloroform over the mouth of his victim. Then, after perhaps a few ineffectual struggles, the latter would succumb to the effects of his inhalation. The man in the light coat, judging from his conduct before getting into the cab, appears to have known the deceased, though the circumstances of his walking away on recognition, and returning again, shows that his attitude towards the deceased was not altogether a friendly one. The difficulty is where to start from in the search after the author of what appears to be a deliberate murder, as the deceased seems to be unknown, and his presumed murderer has escaped. But it is impossible that the body can remain long without being identified by some one, as though Melbourne is a large city, yet it is neither Paris nor London, where a man can disappear in a crowd and never be heard of again. The first thing to be done is to establish the identity of the deceased, and then, no doubt, a clue will be obtained leading to the detection of the man in the light coat, who appears to have been the perpetrator of the crime. It is of the utmost importance that the mystery in which the crime is shrouded should be cleared up, not only in the interests of justice, but also in those of the public, taking place as it did in a public conveyance, and in the public street. To think that the author of such a crime is at present at large, Walking in our midst, and perhaps preparing for the committal of another, is enough to shake the strongest nerves. In one of Dubois Gobie's stories, entitled An Omnibus Mystery, a murder closely resembling this tragedy takes place in an omnibus. But we question if even that author would have been daring enough to write about a crime being committed in such an unlikely place as a handsome cab. Here is a great chance for some of our detectives to render themselves famous, and we feel sure that they will do their utmost to trace the author of this cowardly and dastardly murder. End of chapter 1. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.